Babysitting. It's an important job. Babysitters are the unsung heroes for many families as they give parents a much needed break and more time to themselves. But beyond that, truly, a babysitter's most vital role is to provide an extra layer of protection and care for children. While movies and TV are rife with tropes of teenage babysitters getting stalked, kidnapped, or even murdered, these stories do stem from real-life experiences, and they're terrifying. Before we roll into this episode, let me know down in the pinned comment if there's any sort of story you'd like us to cover. The one with the most likes will get going in the pipeline, so get down there and vote as well. Now, here are five creepy babysitter disappearances that remain unsolved. Number five, Evelyn Hartley. It all began on October 24, 1953, when Evelyn was called by a professor at a local college in La Crosse, Wisconsin, to babysit his 20-month-year-old daughter. The 15-year-old actually had plans to watch a homecoming football game, but the child's regular babysitter was also out to watch the game. Being a hardworking student, she thought this could be a good opportunity to study, while at the same time earning some cash. So at around 6 that evening, Professor Ross Mewson, the employer, picked the teenager up and brought her to his house on Hoshler Drive. Before leaving, Evelyn's father instructed the child to call their home at 8 p.m. to check in. When she didn't call, Mr. Hartley decided to drive over to Ross Mewson's house to check if his daughter was okay, and when he arrived, he found the door locked, but the lights and radio were still on. So he knocked and he rang the doorbell, but still no one answered. He peered through one of the windows and saw Evelyn's glasses and one of her shoes lying on the floor. With his curiosity now piqued, he walked around the house to find an opening. By this time, a neighbor of the Rasmussens took notice of the babysitter's father snooping around. After being told of his intention, he eventually joined in the probe. Inside, they found the toddler fast asleep in her crib, but Evelyn was nowhere in sight. Desperation forced the parent to then call the police, who immediately headed over. Their investigation would soon uncover some of the most unnerving details of the incident. Detectives found pry marks on the windows suggesting that there had been multiple attempts to break into the residence before the perpetrator finally gained entry through the basement. They also discovered blood traces inside, near the basement window and in the yard. There was even a bloody handprint found on the wall of the garage, all of which eventually matched the girl's blood type. Judging from the presence of blood, police surmise that Evelyn's abductor may have carried her from the house and then out into the yard. A manhunt was immediately made, which included the use of tracking dogs, With the help of the animals, they were able to follow the missing girl's scent, which ended two blocks from the Rasmussen home. It was then believed that she must have been placed inside a vehicle parked there. An even bigger search operation followed soon after. Volunteers coming from local authorities, the community, and even the National Guard and Air Force joined in the effort. Police also asked hunters to stay alert while they were out in the field. The task force even resorted to digging fresh graves to make sure that the girl hadn't been buried secretly. Local law enforcement went on to set up checkpoints where they inspected the back seat and trunk of every car passing by in the county. Suffice to say, Evelyn's disappearance had become one of the largest missing person searches in Wisconsin's history. But even then, they still couldn't find her. Almost 70 years have passed and Evelyn Hartley's whereabouts still remain unknown. Several theories have emerged, including the possibility that she could have been the victim of a serial killer, but that's been mostly debunked. Evelyn's parents have both since passed away, and they died without knowing the fate of their kind daughter, who only wanted to help in the first place, but instead became a victim of a grisly crime. Number 4. Laura Jean Lloyd Conflict with parents and siblings, as well as abuse and neglect, are contributing factors 
why youths run away from home. Lori Jean Lloyd's disappearance case is thought to have revolved around this matter. On February 11, 1976, the 14-year-old spent the night babysitting at a residence in Kettering, Ohio. She was accompanied by one of her friends. At around midnight, Lori's mother came to check on her daughter. What she found was the friend and the child, but not the teenager. The latter's companion said that the girl went to a nearby 7-Eleven store, but she apparently didn't come back. The ensuing investigation revealed that she wasn't at the convenience store in the first place, as no one there remembered seeing Lori that night. It was soon found out that the youngster had been talking about meeting an unidentified boy that night. The couple were supposed to run away to California together. The story has never been substantiated, though, considering that she left without her personal belongings. Years waned by and the case eventually went cold. That is, until 1980, when the Lloyd family saw a documentary film about the drug epidemic in California. And the thing that caught their attention was a girl whom they said resembled Lori. This lead was then picked up, and the production company was told to produce the signed release forms to help police identify this female subject. A signed release form is a standard document used by filmmakers or photographers It gives them the right to film or take a picture of another person for a project. Interestingly, the production couldn't find the paperwork for Lori or any other young woman resembling her who appeared in that documentary. So, could the girl really have run away and wound up hanging out with shady individuals? Or could she have been abducted and murdered? No one really knows. As such, Lori Jean Lloyd who should now be around 60 years old, remains a missing person. Number 3. Heather Cullern The last thing anyone wants to do is get caught up in a mess that they didn't intend to be involved in. However, this is exactly the same dire situation that Heather Cullern found herself in. At least, that's what everyone believed. It was in July of 1999 when Heather moved in with family friends Dana Madden and Christopher Herbert at their apartment on Yale Avenue in Richmond Heights, Missouri. She was there to work full-time as a nanny for the couple's two-month-old daughter. At 10 p.m. on July 15th, the baby's mother left to work an overnight shift at a local convenience store, and the father wasn't home either, leaving Heather and the infant all by themselves. Christopher returned home at around 4 in the morning the next day to find his daughter crying, but the babysitter was nowhere to be found. He then called his wife, who in turn alerted the police. An extensive search took place within the next hours, and dozens of people were being interviewed. One of them said that around 2 in the morning, he saw a man carrying what he surmised to be a baby wrapped in a blanket. Though he couldn't clearly see, as he was without his glasses at the time, he was certain that the stranger came out from Dana and Christopher's apartment. Detectives did confirm that a comforter was missing from that residence. They also found traces of blood on the couch, and DNA testing confirmed that it belonged to Heather. The case took a disturbing turn when investigators discovered drug paraphernalia inside the apartment. Eyes then quickly turned to the homeowners, who reportedly had ties to a group suspected of producing methamphetamine. It was said that Christopher allegedly stole drug manufacturing equipment a day before Heather vanished, and there were also reports indicating that the girl may have witnessed illegal drug activity taking place at the apartment. As such, police theorized that her disappearance could somehow be connected to a drug conflict Christopher was eventually sentenced to several years in prison on federal drug charges, but not for the teen's disappearance. Meanwhile, a violent altercation happened between Dana and Heather's mother nine months after the incident. The parent accused the couple of being responsible for her daughter's predicament, to which they strongly denied. Police did monitor a number of people whom they believed had connections to the missing persons case, but... The lack of evidence hindered them from making any arrests. 
Mrs. Cullarn, who died in 2017, remained steadfast in her belief that her poor child was an unintended victim of a drug feud gone wrong. Number two, Margaret Fox. Long before the widespread use of sites like Glassdoor, GetWork, and LinkedIn, people who were looking for jobs advertised their services in newspapers. Margaret Fox was only 14 when she made one for herself, but little did she know that this would end up being the root of her family's grief. On June 24, 1974, Margaret told her parents she'd be meeting a man named John Marshall. The latter apparently had responded to her job posting for a babysitter, and they were supposed to meet a few days back, but that got postponed, and finally, they would be meeting on that date. The employer instructed the young job seeker through a phone call to look for a red Volkswagen that he'd be driving once she gets to Mount Holly, a town in Burlington County, New Jersey. And so Margaret took the bus to get to that address. Her younger sister even accompanied her to the bus stop and saw her board the bus, and she has not been seen since. The girl's family immediately notified authorities of her disappearance, and the ensuing investigation revealed that the phone number given to the teenager belonged to a payphone. This discovery led police to believe that there wasn't a job opportunity in the first place, and that this John Marshall was nothing but a fake name. Four days after Margaret vanished, a phone call came through to the Fox residence. The male caller reportedly demanded a $10,000 ransom for the child's safe return. In the recorded conversation, he can be heard saying, $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the buttered topping. As ominous as it was, authorities somehow failed to identify the caller. And this lack of information forced police to put the case on the back burner. However, a few surprising details did surface through the years, including one in 1992 when a girl's body was discovered in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. The victim's description was a near-perfect match to the missing girl, but the police were once again stumped when a DNA sampling revealed that she wasn't Margaret. Almost half a century has already passed, but the mystery of Fox's disappearance continues to haunt her family and the community in Burlington, New Jersey. Even now, no one knows what became of the girl, who would now be in her 60s and the true identity of her abductor. Number 1. Kelly Cook The thing about being a parent is that whatever misfortune your child goes through, you always have part of yourself to blame. For more than 40 years, Kelly Cook's parents lived in utter remorse and regret just for letting their child go without asking more questions. The tragedy began on April 22, 1981, when Kelly received a phone call at their home in Standard in Alberta, Canada, from a man who identified himself as Bill Christensen. Christensen asked if she was available to babysit for his child later that night. He explained that he had actually called another girl days before for the job, but she declined the offer because she had other commitments. Christensen then asked if he could be referred to another babysitter, to which she apparently gave him Kelly's number. The 15-year-old was somewhat excited for this opportunity, and it was supposed to be her first time, but... She had to ask her mother, who in turn instructed the child, to check on the person. She did ask around her school about the man, and curiously her classmates said they had never heard of the name. Now, Christensen is a common surname in the village, and so people said it would probably be okay. And they assumed that he might have lived close by based on the last name. When she went back home, the young girl assured her mother that everything would be fine because people knew him and the parent finally agreed. And so on that night, the car pulled up outside of the Cook's residence. Kelly bid farewell to her mom, and that was the last time her family ever saw her alive. The Cook household began to worry when the teenager failed to phone her mother to check in, and Mrs. Cook immediately called around town to know if they knew of a man named Bill Christensen. Fear eventually set in when nobody could vouch for the man's existence, 
The parents quickly called the police, who then began a search operation. Cars were stopped and searched. Woods and ditches were explored. Barns and abandoned farmhouses were turned over as well, but there wasn't a single sign of Kelly anywhere. Then two months later, on June 28th, her body was discovered by teenagers on the shore of Chin Lake, which is about 200 kilometers south of Standard. The victim was found bound with rope and weighed down with cinder blocks. Somewhat surprisingly, she was fully clothed when recovered, and the autopsy revealed no signs of sexual assault. Though authorities couldn't determine the exact cause of death, it was believed that she died by strangulation. The news of her abduction and murder shocked everyone in town, but obviously, no one was more devastated than Kelly's parents, who only had themselves to blame for their daughter's demise. Meanwhile, the killer has never been found. Bill Christensen, if that is his name, was reportedly around 35 to 40 years old at the time the incident took place, so if he's still alive, he should be in his 80s. The case remains unsolved, and to show their support to the victim's family, the small village of Standard raised a $100,000 reward to whoever could point out those who were truly responsible for the crime. Suffice to say, though, that amount is yet to be claimed. Thanks so much for tuning in. Please subscribe and hit the notification so you don't miss out on all the new content we're putting out each and every week. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you soon.